for I guess for anybody who's new here, uh, we're we're basically reading this book, Keeping the Heart, and uh, by John Flavel, and we're doing a study. And right now we're going through uh, what are the twelve seasons of a Christian's life. And if you look in your outline at the very top. Uh, we have the first four <coughs> seasons because we've already covered uh, season one, season two, and season three, and so tonight we're going to be covering uh, season four. So, the season four is uh, time of danger or public distraction, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, start by reading the introduction. You can just follow along. It says, in the fourth season, we are to consider how our hearts should stand in the midst of great fear over the threatening troubles in our world. In such times, the best hearts are too apt to be surprised by slavish fear. If Syria be confederate with Ephraim, how do the hearts of the house of David shake, even as the trees of the wood which are shaken with the wind? That's a quote from Isaiah, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2 from chapter 7. When they are ominous signs in the heaven, or the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and waves roaring, then the hearts of men fail to fear, and looking for, and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. That's Luke 21, and actually it should be a verses 25 to 26. Or as Paul shows in Second uh, Corinthians 7, 5, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. Our hearts should cry like David in Psalm 27. Though like all men, believing and unbelieving, it is unavoidable to have natural fear of those things happening in the world before us. But as Flavel puts it, I know it cannot be said of a saint, as God said of Leviathan, that he is made without fear. There is a natural fear in every man, and it is, in, it is as impossible to remove it wholly as to remove the body itself. There is even a providential fear God puts in man, such as in Jacob in Genesis 32, 6 through 12. And I think that's a good uh, portion to look into, that, which is uh, for us to read at uh, Genesis uh, 32, verses uh, 6 through 12. Are you going to read it? Huh? You read it? Uh, no, actually, I was going to have somebody read it. Would you mind reading it, actually? No once, once we get there. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, Genesis 32, verses 6 through 12. Are so, yeah, and just yeah, just and basically, we're, what we're going to see here is an example of of providential fear. In other words, you know, a godly fear. Mm. Okay. <laughs> And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, If Esau comes to, comes to the one company and attacks it, then the company which is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who didst say to me, Return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all of the faithfulness which thou hast shown to thy servant. For with my staff I only crossed, only I crossed the Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the, the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and attack me the mothers with the children. For thou didst say, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Okay. <coughs> so if we go back to the introduction. <coughs> Excuse me. I have, it is uh, the fear of diffidence from which I persuade you to keep your heart. Uh, diffidence is, is uh, kind of like saying, like a... Uh, like it's, like it's like shyness, you know, like like it's a it's a type of fear of which you know, you know, kind of keeps you in a, in a state of shyness from sh from shying away from things, you know. Shying away from what? 
from sh- shying away from things. So in other words, it's the kind of fear that makes you shy, shy away from things. And so, so John Flavel was saying that, that unlike uh, Jacob, you know, who did have a fear, but he, you know, but he put the concern, you know, upon the Lord and recognized, you know, God's providence. You know, he's speaking of, you know, the kind of fear where, you know, we don't even do that. We just want to run away from things and not deal with them. You know. So it says, I would persuade you to keep your heart that that tyrannical passion when it, which invades the heart in times of danger distracts, weakens, and unfits it for duty, drives men upon unlawful means, and brings a snare with it. Our hearts should stand in the Lord whom delivers us. As Paul states in Second Corinthians 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So, to kind of give us an synopsis of what we read, basically we're, we're dealing with trying to keep our hearts in a time when, you know, we have natural disasters, such as, you know, the troubles of the world, where you can have, like, natural disasters, or even, you know, uh, political, political, such as, you know, nations getting ready to war with each other, and, and uh, you know, so we have the situation here where, you know, we're, we're learning that, you know, the scriptures, you know, teaches us that we're to trust in the Lord, and, you know, part of, of uh, keeping our heart is doing that, you know, standing fast, uh, you know, in our faith and trusting in the Lord. And what we see here is uh, there's two points to the message. One is that, you know, that first of all, we're being told not to fear, you know, in, in these particular times. But at the same time, you know, uh, I like the fact that, you know, John Flavel points out that there, there is a, such a thing as, as you know, a uh, holy fear, you know, in which we have a, a, you know, a providential concern. Sometimes, you know, we do need to fear about things, but we need to examine, you know, when we're sinfully fearing and when we're, you know, you could say righteously fearing. And so uh, one, of the, one, one of the examples that we saw right here was, of course, uh, uh, you know, the issue with Jacob. And we know, we know his history with his brother, you know, that he, uh, he took the uh, birthright from his brother. And so his brother was seeking his life. But, yet, you know, he remembered the promises of God, you know, what he uh, promised to him. And, and, you know, instead of just fearing for his life and thinking that he was, you know, he would be dead, you know, we see that by the grace of God, you know, he was able to recognize, you know, the providence of the Lord and appeal to it, you know, especially in this time when, you know, he was going to meet up with his brother. So, um, another thing too that I, that I like too is uh, what, you know, the, the last uh, verse which deals with uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10, which is that, you know, where he puts up, for the, sorrow, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret leading to salvation and then it says but the sorrow of the world produces death so you know so there is a sense of sorrow you know that we can have in our lives but you know it's but it's got to be a, you know it's got to be a sorrow it's got to be a, a fear that produces good fruit you know that that is yielding you know to the holiness of God as opposed to the world who you know they have no hope you know so what do they do they find as, as, as it says here you know they, they find any which way you know, to protect themselves or, you know, keep themselves in, in the midst of fear. So, um, I'm not sure if uh, you guys have, you know, any situations where you've seen where perhaps, you know, you might be able to make a contrast where you can see where, you know, there is, you know, an example of someone where they've had, you know, a, a, a situation where there's been, you know, a, you could say a righteous fear and then a situation where, you know, someone was clear, clearly sitting. So are you saying that if when when natural disasters come upon, like let's just say the 9/11 or any you know the earthquakes mm-hmm. and stuff, that we shouldn't be uh, showing the fear like the world? We should still be with hope. Or, I mean, is, is that well, yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, what? What? What we're what we're learning here is that you know that as human beings, you know, like I put here, uh, you know, unbelieving, whether it's you know believers or unbelievers, we're all going to have fear. You know, like in 9/11. I mean, you know. We don't, you know, none of us really, you know, have a desire to die. None of us want to die and we want to protect our lives. So, obviously, we are going to have a fearful reaction. But I think what we're looking at is, you know, how are we to deal with this? But there are situations actually, you know, where I think the Lord is calling us to not even fear. To not even put fear in those things. Such as in, you know, with the situation with the, uh, with the terrorists. I think sometimes I feel like some people are, you know, they're more afraid of the terrorists than they are, you know, afraid of the Lord. 
You know, and so that's not what you want because that or can have... Bush. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you mean there should be a difference in the way that we confront or, or, or respond to all these disasters? Yes, exactly. There, are, there, there, there should, yeah, there's definitely... Get, there has to be a difference between the way a, a Christian, you know, deals with the, with the situation and the way the world does. I mean, you know, especially, you know, because we believe that, you know, God is in control. So, you know, if such a thing has happened, you know, the Lord, you know, the Lord has a purpose for it. You know, so, so the question... Like, almost like, the, was it a scripture we read last, last week, where it says that the wicked, uh, with the ruffling of the, of the leaves, are frightened? Oh, yeah. Was, was that, was that a scripture <coughs> that we read? I... I don't remember. I think maybe it's something I read in the mm-hmm. in a book or something. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember if I, if I put that in the notes, but but yeah, but definitely, yeah, they're they're easily shaken. Yeah. They're easily shaken. And I think actually, uh, even here, I think one of the quotes uh, uh, mentions that. Yeah, actually, in the beginning, where it says uh, that in such times the best hearts are too apt to be surprised with selfish fear. It says, if Syria be confederate with Ephraim, how do the hearts of the house of David shake? Even as the trees of the wood, which are shaken with the wind. Yeah. You know so. So in other words, we're not supposed to, you know, get scared right away and, you know, you know, oh my God, and start getting fearful and getting, and getting consumed, you know, by the fear. Because you know that God is sovereign and whatever comes upon us is yeah. his, his design. Yeah, and, par- and part of that is, you know, I mean, the purpose of keeping the heart is to be able to, you know, keep from sinning. So, you know, a lot of times I think what we're dealing with here is that when you have these uh, situations, you know, what the Lord is is basically asking is, you know, that even if we do have a concern, you know, that how we react to the situation is what's important. Because some people even go as far as sinning, you know. They can cheat, they can lie, you know, to get themselves out of a situation, you know. Yeah, yeah. you know, even, even, you know, like, even in situations of, of disasters, you know, you have situations where people are, like, running out of a building, you know, they're not, they're looking out for themselves. And in the process, they what? They trample people and kill people. You know, and, and that's not the way, you know, or that like we should go the, about. What was it, the, was Compton, when that whole riot had happened? Yeah. You know, all the load, loitering that was going on, people were seeing it as a moment right. to go and pull out all the stuff yeah. from the stores and were running out stealing. Or even there, you know, I mean, like, if you take, it, if you take, take an example, yeah, that's a perfect example. I mean, you have people, you have people who are, you know, sitting by going out and, and stealing, and then you have, other, and then you have, you probably have people too who are sitting because they're too busy instead of, you know, prioritizing things, trying to, you know, keep their their house together, you know, in order, even to the I point mean, of maybe... I mean, they see that disaster is an opportunity still to do some bad. Yeah. It's kind of like when uh, when the disaster was going to come upon Sodom and Gomorrah. No, no, not the disaster, wasn't it? When the angels came and yeah. they wanted, even when the blindness, they were still, you know, struggling to do evil. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they still seek. And, and so, you know, there's a variety of situations, you know, and, and that's what we want to do is, you know, kind of pay attention to, you know, what we're looking for is what can we do? What can we do and how can we handle this? And so uh, the next section is actually, the next uh, yeah, sections that we're going to be looking at is it's going to be basically uh, rules that are I'm given sorry, by... I had something to say. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> no it's, yeah, just we're going to be going through uh, uh, basically uh, rules that uh, John Flavel, uh, I think it's 14, 14 different rules. Of, you know, you could also look at them as 14 different points as to, you know, what we can do in light of that situation and the, and the different situations that, you know, that occur. So, and that's, so that's going to be our next section, and that's uh, where I have a, there are several excellent rules for keeping a heart from simple fear when imminent dangers threaten us. So if I can have a, let's see, would you mind reading that, sister? Maybe well, we can my, go around? My gloves are not. Really okay, no problem. Would, would you mind? Mm-hmm. One? Yes, on, on point one. You can just read the, read the paragraph there. The whole thing? Yes. Okay. Look upon all creatures as in the hand of God, who manages them in all their motions, limiting, restraining, and determining them at His pleasure. Get this great truth well settled by faith in your heart, and it will guard you against salvish fears. Slavish, slavish fears? Yes. All must answer to the Lord. Job 1 through, through 1, 6 through 12. In Revelation 6, you read of white, black, and red horses, which are but the instruments God employs in executing judgment 
in the world. As wars Yes. Yes. When these horses are prancing and traveling up and down in the world, here is a consideration that might that may quiet our hearts. God has the reins in his hands. Wicked men are sometimes like mad horses. They would stamp the people of God under their feet, but that the brittle but that the bridle of providence is in their mouths. A lion at liberty is terrible to meet, but who is afraid of a lion in the keeper's head? Yeah. Yeah, so, so in other words here the so the first point has to do with you know, the providence of God. That God is in control. Mm-hmm. And all you know, all things all things are determined according to, you know, his holy will. And I'd like us to turn to uh, Job uh, chapter one, six to twelve to see an example of that from scripture. What? Job uh, chapter one, and we're gonna we're, we're gonna read us verses six through twelve. One chapter one verses six through twelve. Somewhere else. Jets in the mail, sir. How you doing, Billy? Uh, don't scare Penny. Uh, Sorry. We're in Job chapter one, verses sixty-four. And brother, I'm, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Albert. 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 Would you mind reading uh, uh, verses six and twelve? If that's okay. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present, to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, said to Satan Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job what does Job Job does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your your and the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So right here, you, you know, you have a good example. First of all, you know, you have the image of the angels, you know, coming and reporting to the Lord. So, you know, so they're not out and about doing their own thing. You know, we see that, you know, the Lord is in control. And then, you know, we, we see through the conversation that, you know, Job, I'm, I'm sorry, that Satan actually and, and the Lord are, are having, that, you know, that God is in control of Job's, uh, Job's life and the situation. You know, he, he talks, you know, talks about a hedge, about, about having a hedge around him. And so, you know, this is a good example of how, you know, we are to look at our lives, you know, which is to see that, Everything that we have, the situations that we're in, even the bad situations, you know, the Lord has has used, you know, what's around us, you know, for His own purpose. Mm -hmm. So we can go on to the uh, second point. And uh, would you mind, Sandra, reading the second point? Sure. Okay. (coughs) Remember that this God, in whose hand are all creatures, is your Father, and is much more tender of you than you are or can be of yourself. He that touches you, touches the apple of my eye, so said the Lord to Zion, in Zechariah 2, 5 through 9, when he declared to save them from their enemies. As John Flavel illustrates, let me ask the most timorous woman whether there be not a great difference between the sight of a drawn sword and the hand of a bloody ruffian? 
Ruffian. Ruffian? Mm -hmm. And of the same sort in the hand of her own tender husband. Mm -hmm. As great a difference there is between looking upon creature by an eye of sense and looking on them as in the hand of your God by an eye of faith. Mm -hmm. Who would be afraid to pass through an army though all the soldiers should turn their swords and guns towards him if the commander of that army were his friend or father? Consider Christ first as a king and supreme lord over the providential kingdom and then as your head, husband, and friend and you will quickly say, Return unto thy rest, O my soul. Psalm 116.7 <coughs> This truth will cause you to stop fearing and instead, and instead sing in the midst of danger. The Lord is King of all the earth. Sing ye praise with understanding. Psalm 47. Yeah. So, we see not only that, you know, he's, you know, his providence is there in terms of that he's in control of all things, but there's also the fact that, you know, he's tender to us mm -hmm. and that, you know, we, we can definitely hope and, and trust in his hand. And what I'd like to do is actually for that second point, I'd like to go to Zechariah 2 and read uh, verses 5 to 9. Where is that? That's yeah, towards the end, of the end of, it's towards the end of the, uh, yeah, like the Old the, Testament? Yeah, towards the end of the Old Testament, one of the last books. Like Daniel, you know, keep going. <laughs> I think it might be like, it might be like, <laughs> it's the second to last book. Yeah, it's, it's like the second to the last or so. So it's chapter 2. We're going to read uh, verses 5 through 9. I'll go ahead and read it. it. says, As for the promise which I made to you, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while, and I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. They will come with the wealth of all nations. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. I'm sorry, didn't you say three through five? Yeah, three Oh, you know what, I'm actually, I'm, I apologize, I was reading Haggai. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm in the wrong oh, chapter. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was like, what does that have to do with keeping it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like sorry about two, that. two, five, right? Yeah, yeah, nine, yeah, five, yeah. Yeah. Real, yeah, chapter two, <laughs> yeah, five through nine. I was looking through two and I couldn't find anything. I was, yeah, like, yeah, I, I was yeah. looking at Mike's Bible. Talk about getting lost. Where am I? Excuse me. That's Zechariah. You want me to read it for you? Uh, sure. Actually, yeah, please. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. For I declares the Lord will be a wall of fire around her and I will be the glory in her midst. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Ho Zion, escape you who are living in the daughter of, with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plunder for their slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, so, you know, so here you have a good example of, you know, where... You know, Israel was, was being punished, you know, for, for their sins, but yet at the same time, you know, the providence of God was there. And now he's even, you know, going, you know, he's prophesying that he's going to go against the nations, you know, that are there to plunder them. I think another uh, good point that actually uh, I, I didn't put in there, but I thought about also was, I, don't, in, uh, I think it's in Luke where, you know, Jesus is walking with his disciples and... And uh, I think I think he's dealing with prayer, and there's a you know, but he asks them you know about you know asking God you know that if 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 they if they uh, ask in His name you know that He will give to them, and you know he and he asks them you know that if you you know if you you know being being you know men you know will you know if your child asks you for you know 
for bread, you don't, you know, give them a scorpion or, you know, you don't, in other words, you don't do evil to them, you know, then how, you know, like he says, how much more, you know, does the Lord in heaven, how much more would, would he not give to us, you know, so I think that's a, you know, a good point to consider. And if you guys ever, if you guys want to add in, feel free to add whenever you want. <laughs> so we'll go to, uh, um, I'm going to, I'm actually going through these uh, a little faster because there's a little bit more points than, than we had last week. So, Amen. okay. So we'll go ahead and go to uh, number, three. number three. And if, Carlos, if you mind. <coughs> okay. Urge upon your heart, urge upon your heart the express prohibitions of Christ in this case. And let your heart stand in awe of the violation of them. God has called us not to fear when when we shall hear of wars and commotions, see that ye be not terrified. Luke 2, 21, 9. And nothing be terrified by your adversaries. Philippians 1, 28. The Lord himself urges his followers, followers to not fear even in the midst of troubles, as in um, Matthew 10, 26 through 31. So bring thyself then to this reflection in times of danger. If I let into my heart the slavish fear of man, I must let out the rever- reverential? reverential awe and fear of God. And there I cast off the fear of the Almighty for the frowns of, of a man. Mm-hmm. Shall I lift up proud dust above the great God? Shall I run upon a certain sin to shun the probable danger? Oh, keep thy heart by this consideration. Yeah, so now, so now we're looking... This, this is dealing a little more, I think, with, with uh, in reference to our heart, which is that, you know, that the key is that, you know, that when we're in the midst of fear, that we do take in consideration, you know, the prohibitions of Christ mm-hmm. to not, you know, go in and be sinful. And first of all, be fearful of men. Because, you know, what is a man, you know? What, you know, what's the worst? Do, yeah. You know, so, so I, uh, later on, I, you know, we're going to see the, the scripture where, you know, where we're told, you know, not to, you know, not to fear man, you know, not to fear he who kills a body, but, you know, but to fear, you know, him who, who, you know, who can throw your body, you know, your into, body in your soul. yeah, in your soul, and what does cast it mean you into, right there, shall I run upon a certain sin to shun a probable danger, what does that mean, to, uh, we're, the end of that, of that paragraph, well, on, on number the two, the last right? question, <coughs> so, or is it that shit, the Shall I run upon a certain sin to show a probable danger? Like a I run upon a what does that mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. What, what, that's actually yeah. What, what that's saying is you know, in order to prevent a danger, mm-hmm. you know, will you go is you know, will you go to the you know to the extreme of sinning? So Make an example. so to give an example, right. well, for instance, you know, like let's say when you have the whole thing with with uh, you know, let's say with the Nazis or something. You know what I mean? Like if um. You know, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's a hard, hard, hard thing to show. But you know, if um, let's say you know you're in the midst of escaping, and you know, and there's a guard there, so you know, if you might be able to just you know avoid let's say killing them, you know, and being able to escape. But a lot of times, you know, you could be in a situation where perhaps you feel, you know what, I, I don't even want to take that chance. So you know, you shoot the man and you just kill him. That way, you know, by killing him you can preserve your life, you know, and situations like that, there's certain situations where, you know, sometimes it could be a... Or to lie to get out of something so nobody would get upset at you, you know? Yeah, or cheat somebody, you know, cheat somebody to to get something, you know, like, I mean, you know... You on your taxes, you can get more. Yeah, I mean, or, you, or, you know... me from a probable danger. You can be in danger, danger of going to jail them. because you're committing fraud. No, but how would that have, to shun a probable danger? Um, oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would, to yeah. suddenly get yourself yeah. out of trouble. Ah, right. Yeah, to shun means to to shun means to like you know to do away with or you know like if you shun somebody you're like you know basically kind of caving them the cold shoulder. So what it's saying is you know would you know, would you go to the extreme to sin in order to avoid a, a danger, you know? I mean, I mean one, one example I can think of is, you know, like, you know, like right now you've been, you know, wor- worried about the whole thing with Social Security, you know, they, they're going through the legal means of doing it because, you know, they need it, but yet there's other people who 
because you know they 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 don't want to be in a you know a situation you know they're willing to cheat and lie you know the government to get that when other people who you know who could have really needed it mm. could have had it but they were they were willing to overstep that just so they can get you know what they think they need but you can get more violent that? you can get a little more violent though I mean uh, I just reminded by uh, Caleb's shirt it says it's not it's a child not a choice uh, there are some people that are Christians or religious who will go and bring a bomb to an abortion clinic. They're going to be committing a sin in order to avoid the danger of a bunch of babies being murdered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that a, good, that's a good example. Well, who, was, uh, who was the, the example in the scriptures, Ahab, that was trying to take the vineyard, remember, from... I forgot the story, but... Ahab the king, remember? Jezebel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was his wife, and he was trying to take the vineyard from some guy... And the guy knew that if it was... If well, he wanted him to sell it, right? And then the guy didn't yeah, want to sell it? Yeah, it. he didn't want to sell because it. Because he knew it was the inheritance of the Lord. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's a godly man. But that man, by his example, he could have said, you know, I'll give him the thing before because I'm going to be in danger. The king might kill me. You know, he's the king. But he, he kept to his to the promise of God that, hey, this is the land that, that I promised to you to your father, so you got to keep it, not sell it. And you see, he, he didn't sell it and they ended up dying. He, ki- they, he killed them. You know, the guy died. The guy from the vineyard. So Ahab could get his vineyard. Caleb had an example. Yeah, well, yeah, just from the context of <coughs> what he's saying, he's saying God has called us not to fear. And then he also talks about uh, don't let your heart into the slavish fear of man. So he's kind of, it seems like he's saying, don't be afraid of man, and at the same time you're neglecting to fear God. So it's like, in a social context that I could think of, you're nervous about sharing the gospel with somebody or, or something like that, and so you disobey God just because you're afraid of ridicule or, or rejection, or, or rejection, or, or even you know like messing up somehow. Just. You're, but you're disobeying God just to to save your own skin, right? And to shun a, a possible danger or something. Yeah, yeah and, and in the beginning it says when when you shall you know in the scriptures it says when you shall hear of wars and commotions, see that all you not be terrified. So it's also you know giving us a context that you know you shouldn't be terrified. You know if things you know like right now you know we're, if we're, if we're, if we're under the threat of you know Islamic terror. You know we you know we tend to you know want to, wanna, you know, like, even right now, you know, that's why a lot of people you know, are debating the whole issue of uh, the, uh, the Patriot Act, because some people, some people think that that was a ploy, you know, to, to work on people's fears, because since, you know, you have this, this terror, they think, oh, you know, the government's taking advantage of playing on their fears, you know, to take away their, their rights, you know, and so, and so, you know, that, that's, you have to have a, you know, we're, since we're in the context of keeping the heart, you know, you got to be balanced, and we always have to, you know, our vision's always in Christ. So, you know, the other things that we have going on around us, you know, we got to sort of look at that in the balance. And so what the Lord, so what we're learning is that, you know, fear is, it can be a great sin and can be, a, you know, uh, like a barrier. In other, yeah, in other words, you know, to keep us, because a lot of it has to do with our condition. How are, you know, how are our, our conditions in terms of uh, on a day-by-day basis, you know. And I think we all, you know, we all have our, our own situations that we can deal with, you know, as far as, you know, even I think, you know, like sometimes we can be in a small situation like myself. I mean, I know where, you know, I have my car. It's an old car, you know, and, and you know, and I'm always afraid, you know, I want to always, you know, keep it up because I don't want it to, you know, break down because then I'm, I'm going to lose work and that's going to affect my paycheck and stuff. So, you know, you can, I mean, I can't think of anything specific, but, you know, there's different ways that, you know, I could use that that fear of that and, and, you know, try and cheat somebody or something like that and then that would be uh, myself, you know, doing exactly what we're talking about which is I'm so caught up with trying to get rid of the problem that I'm willing to do whatever it takes whatever, including, whatever yeah, at whatever cost and then that's, that's where the sin comes in and so the Lord is saying you are not to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In other words, if, you know, in light of the other points too, if God, you know, if we, if we live in the providence of God, you know, the God will, we have to trust in the Lord that He will provide. You know? But even, you know, later on we'll see another point, but even if he doesn't, you know, we're still, it's still not, you know, right for us to go and sin. It's not a right basis to sin.
Okay, we'll go, we'll go on to uh, uh, point number four. Mm-hmm. And uh, Cindy, if you don't mind, I'll have you read that. <coughs> Remember how much needless trouble your vain fears have brought upon you formerly. The Lord asks in Isaiah 51.13, And you forget the Lord your Maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You have feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor. When he has prepared to destroy, where is the fury of the oppressor? Flavel comments, comments, it is as if God should say, He seems ready to devour yet you are not devoured. I have not brought upon you the thing that you feared. You have wasted your spirit, disordered your soul, and weakened your hands to no purpose. You might have uh, all this while enjoyed your peace and possessed your soul in patience. So, <coughs> so in other words, like this is, I think, a really good point, which is, you know, which is showing that, you know, a lot of times we get, we get caught up with, with our problems. You know, with our fears, and we always, you know, and I think we all have the tendency to do that. I mean, I can s- definitely speak for myself. You know, you always, you're always preparing for the worst. Mm-hmm. But you know, but the thing is, you know, even though you're, pre- you know, even though that's that's what we prepare ourselves for, you know, we have to believe and trust in the Lord. And a lot of times, if we, especially at, what I like about this is that you know, as Christians, this can really apply to us because if you look back, if you look back, you know, at, at different points of your life of things that you've gone through, you know, there's so many things that the Lord delivers us from. You know, I know in my family, especially that, you know, I mean, even if I was to just take, you know, the example of my dad, you know, my dad, and my dad, you know, he's an an unbeliever, but, you know, he's been in the hospital, you know, so many times, even right now, he, he, uh, you know, he got the shingles, and he's going through it, and, you know, but the Lord is there. The Lord is there, and, you know, what you know, step by step, we go through it. I mean, we always, you know, when he had his his two heart attacks, you know, you know, at, at the time when you're there, you're like, hey, this is it. Looks like this could be it. But yet, there he is. You know, the Lord has has uh, you know provided, yeah, and you know, showed him, you know, his good and common grace. So I think that's that's one thing that we should do is you know look back and and think you know about the fact that a lot of times the troubles that we go through, you know, we end up having solutions for. And so all this, so in other words, all this anxiety and all this fear that, that we, you know, we have during that, that time is, not only is it sinful, because a lot of times, you know, we might even end up murmuring against the Lord, you know. Some people, you know, might do that, or, or you know, we can treat people, you know, badly, or sin against the brother, you know. Th- those are things that would be, you know, if we trusted in the Lord, and left it to, you know, whatever, you know, the, the Lord, you know, destiny is which we know is good you know from the previous point you know we wouldn't have to be worried about it that's why I really like the last point which is that it says uh, uh, where is it yeah here we go it says I have I have not brought upon you the thing that you feared you have wasted your spirit disordered your soul weakened your hands to no purpose you might have all what you might have what is it you might have all this while enjoyed your peace pos- and possessed your soul in patience. So, in other words, we dismantle ourselves, you know, we, we go crazy, you know, we, we start worrying, and in other words, you know, in some ways, you know, you could say we can even torture ourselves by doing that, when in the end, you know, we didn't receive what we thought we were going to receive, and we could have spared ourselves, you know, all of that anguish, you know. And sometimes I think that's even unhealthy for some people, you know. Yes. It just yeah. shows I, how I see it is that how, like, we're just wasting our time because God knows what's going to happen and if we just trust in Him, you know, even though we fret and we, we cry and we worry, at the end it's what God says and it's, nothing's going to change it. So yeah. you think, because I know sometimes me, if I would cry and stuff like that, maybe it can change my mom's mind, but it's not going to change God's mind and how he wants my life so we're just basically wasting our time yeah you're right yeah and that's why the from your point is good which is the point of patience Mm -hmm. you know which is that we have to learn to be patient that's part of that's part of the character that we need to have in order to keep our heart because if not you know we dismantle ourselves and obviously if we in our spirit are dismantled and that means our heart is dismantled Mm -hmm. you know 
So we'll go on to uh, number five. And uh, would you mind if I can start with you? Sure. sure. So would you, if you could mind reading number five? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Consider solemnly that though the things you fear should really happen, yet there is more evil in your own fear than in the things feared. Not only, not only as the least evil of sin is worse than the greatest evil of suffering, but as this sinful fear has really more trouble in it that there than there is in the condition of which you are so so much afraid, fear is both a multiplying and a tormenting passion. It represents troubles as much greater than they are, and so tortures the soul much more than the suffering itself. Consider what would ha- what would have become of Israel if they would have done what they were what they will during the Exodus from Egypt. Exodus fourteen one through fourteen. This is why we must keep our heart centered on Christ knowing that as Paul said, God will make a way to escape, 1 Corinthians 10.13, lest we perish in our sin but not keeping our heart, as Flavel illustrates. Thus it was with blessed Bilney, a martyr, when he, would, when he would make a trial by putting his finger to the candle and found himself not able to endure that, he cried out, What? Cannot I bear the burning of a finger? How then shall I be able to bear the burning of my whole body tomorrow? But when that morrow came, he could go cheerily into the flames with this scripture in his mouth. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest passest through the waters, I will be with you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt be burnt. Thou shalt not be burnt. Isaiah 42, 1 through 2. So yeah, so so this is kind of giving... Yeah, it's really the scripture. And, you know, that's, that's a good example, again, you know, kind of furthering the point as far as, you know, the torturing of, of our own souls because, you know, that's a good example also of why, you know, it isn't good to fear, to be, you know, terrified because a lot of times we even go, you could say we go even, we become beside ourselves. We go outside, we think of it, we make it more than what it is. And that, of course, is, is, is very simple. And what I'd like to do is actually... Uh, one of the points here was, you know, I, I just made an allusion to it, but I'd like to uh, read it to, you know, kind of give an example, is uh, Exodus 14. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 14. I'm sorry, what was it? Oh, no problem. We're, we're going to uh, read Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to go through verses um, 1 through 14. And would you mind reading that, Caleb? Sure. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihar Hariroth. Pihariroth, I think it is, yeah. Pihariroth. Pihahira? Pihahira. Pihahira. Yes. Uh, for, uh, let's see. Between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, are, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let... Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took six hundred choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord heart or yeah, and the Lord hardened the hearts of Pharaoh, uh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, 
all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pahira, uh, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh grew, uh, drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why were you so? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again uh, no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So, so here's a, you know, a really good example, because what do we have? You know, the Lord, you know, the Lord commanded them, you know, to leave Egypt, because obviously He wanted, them, first of all, to get them out of bondage, you know, to, to prosper them. But yet, what happened? You know, first of all, we see that in the beginning, they were all gung-ho about it. You know, it says that they boldly went out, and, you know, and what happened? Then all of a sudden, when, when the, you know, the Egyptians were gaining up on them, you know, then they started fearing. And what did they do? Then they sinned. Because then they, you know, they started murmuring against Moses and basically, you know, even accusing him, what? You just basically, you know, you kicked us out of, you know, Egypt to bring us over here to die. Even though, you know, it, was, it wasn't even Moses. It was, you know, the word of the Lord that spoke there. And, you know, we, we obviously know that, you know, that the Lord, you know, provided a way out through the Red Sea. And, you know, but I think that's a good example of, you know, what about if the Lord, you know, would have allowed, you know, for them to do what they wanted? They'd still be back in Egypt and, you know, they'd be in bondage and they probably would have even ceased as a people, you know, because of the oppression of the Egyptians. But by the grace of God, you know what I mean, they were able to be relieved from that. And, you know, so in many ways, you know, that I think that's a good example of, you know, how we can look at the situations in our lives and I mean, and, then, and we're not even in, I, you know, I've never been in a situation like that, you know, where you have a whole army, <laughs> you know, against you and then, you know, so... So even in our small situations, you know, we should trust in the Lord because the Lord has, you know, good plans. Just to tell an example to... Where you can come in. Yeah. Somebody locked? Oh, that was the best example in the world. Oh, man. So, brother, you were going to make a point about the Egyptians and Moses? You're going to record it on your mouth. No, um, I'll make no. sure Arden gets a copy of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's um, the point I was going to make is that you know sometimes we, we we have a tendency to think that that a lot of our troubles are from without, saying our physical troubles that we have daily troubles of you know domestic work related relationships whatever. But I see it. The biggest fight and the biggest army that always comes against us is our own sinfulness. And our dullness, our always slumbering in the Lord, not taking God as serious as we should. Those, those armies and those struggles are always warring against my flesh, warring against me all the time on a daily basis. And that to me is the biggest because we have sometimes a tendency to grow weary and feel that God isn't helping me, you know. I'm doing all my devotions, I'm doing this, and I still feel the weight of my sin on a constant basis. And I think that that's where we should, you know, take this, take this promise or this example and say that I will, I will show you the salvation of the Lord. That's why salvation is by faith, you know, and, and yeah. justification is without works, and pr but it produces works, because at the same time, God strips you of all your self-sufficiency, 
See, that's the difference between a, a, a professing Christian and, not, and, a, and a real Christian. A professing Christian thinks that by his good works, he will gain salvation. And he pomps himself before God, and he, and he thinks that because of all these works that he's doing, that he's, that he's relying on his own armies, basically, you know? Yeah. But he's building up a false hope. God, yeah, we need to strip mm-hmm. ourselves of anything and, and rely definitely on everything. Because I don't think, uh, sometimes, I know from my fact, I don't think I see the sinfulness of my sin and the weight of, of my sin in my heart and the dullness of myself. I'm asleep in the light a lot of times, you know, I'm not really fighting for, for God's holiness. And I think that those things overcome, overcome me, and I don't lay down and say, Lord, you know, save me, you know, or in, a, in, in, a, in a way that, that um, how can I say it, that you're, like in this situation, that the Israelites had nowhere to go, but the sea was either drowned or get killed by the Egyptians. And I think that that's the desperate state we need to be in towards our sin. I think another thing too is yet by um, that you know, you know John Flavel didn't discuss and you know, but was you know the issue of backsliding. And I don't mean it you know like, I mean it can apply I guess in in a sense of you know going away from faith. But I'm even talking about our living in our sanctified life. Like you know, there's moments when we just give up. You know, I can speak for myself. There's times when you know, like so especially. I feel that I have more frustration when, you know, you feel you're on a roll with, with something good and then, you know, it doesn't go your way and you get frustrated and you just decide, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of doing it this way, I'm going to, you know, and you, and you go back to your carnal way. Yeah. You know, and that's definitely... That's where most of us lack in our obedience. We yeah. Don't, we don't follow the, what we're supposed to do, what it tells you in the, in the Bible all the time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, and that's the thing, and, and that's basically what we want to go away from. Because if we're keeping the heart, it means trying to stay in the consistency of, you know, living in the ho- holiness of God, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, you know, so that's one of the things to consider, that even, you know, when we're in, a, in the midst of a bad situation, well, you know, if, you know, like, like the scripture says, all things work for good, you know, to those who love God, so if we love God, you know, the Lord is, is doing something with that, mm-hmm. you know, and in this case, you know, it's kind of interesting because, like you said, I like how you, you, you used it also as a personal basis. You know, because right here, you know, we're, we're dealing with it as far as, like you said, having outside distractions. Yeah. But even with internal distractions, you know, it can apply to the same way. Amen. So can I just say something? I mean, uh, the part that I like about this one that really touched me was that it says that that though the things you fear should really have, no, no, yet there is more evil in your fear than the things feared. I mean, that to mm-hmm. me really t- mm-hmm. touches me because it's true. I mean... It's more evil to fear these things because it's doubting God's love towards us and His provision and the taking care of us yeah. than if that thing was to really happen. Yeah. Because it's bringing God's, like it said up there somewhere, uh, taking the reverential awe and fear of God, you know, where yeah. we're putting it below and putting these things more on a higher level. Yeah, and we're thinking of also another thing too is that, you know, we're thinking very, like right here, when we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, in the midst of, I put a worldly, worldly trouble, such as natural disasters. These are all temporal things. You know what I mean? You know, it's not like you're going to have earthquakes in eternity. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> the whole thing is, you know, we're, we we got to think about that. What are what are we here for? You know, what is what is our true purpose? Our true purpose is for, you know, an eternal purpose. And so, here we have these little things that are occurring, you know, within, you know, our temporal time, and we're going crazy about it, even to the um, the peril of our own soul, you know. That's why I like the example that he gave, you know, of that martyr where, you know, he put his his hand on the fire and he's like, and he couldn't take it, and he's like, man, you know, I, if I can't take that, how am I going to take the fire tomorrow? But you know, how much worse would it be, you know, if he, you know, if he'd be in the fires of hell? So it's better it's better to take that fire than to take, you know, the eternal punishment of hell. Can you imagine you know? knowing that tomorrow you're going to be burned at the stake? Yeah. I'm afraid of going to work tomorrow I'm going to get tired Man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. drag you out and throw you on the stage and light it up and yeah, so. you. <laughs> that's so. crazy well, well we'll go on to uh, uh, <coughs> rule number six and uh, let's see here Sam would you mind reading that? Yeah, yeah. Go. Go. Uh, let's see consult the many precious promises which are written for your support and comfort 
in all dangers. Romans 8, 28 declares, All things shall work together for good. And uh, Ecclesiastes 8, 12, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet it shall be well with them that fear the Lord. We should consider that many promises and mediate Meditate. 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 Sorry. Mm-hmm. And what words of comfort the Lord has given to us. We should realize what it is to abide our hearts in the Lord as the psalmist in Psalm 91. So this, this uh, point number six is a pretty basic point, which is, you know, which is just basically, you know, asking us to ponder and meditate, you know, on all the promises that are in Scripture. And we know that, you know, there's a lot of them. So what I'd like to do is uh, uh, read Psalm 91 as an example of you know one of one of you know one of those promises. Yeah, well, well, actually, you know what? How many how many verses? Sixteen. Sixteen? Yeah, we'll read the whole thing. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, uh, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks, that stacks, excuse me, oh no, stalks in the dar- in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not approach you. You will only look on your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Yeah. So, so I thought, yeah, this would be. I wanted to read the whole thing because, in I mean, from beginning to end, it's just telling you, the Lord is telling you, I'm there, you know, I'm your refuge, I'm your fortress. Yeah. So this is a very, you know, very good promise, you know, that you can see in the Psalms. And it goes to show you that salvation is from God from beginning to end. Absolutely. That if Absolutely. you're living for Him. Yeah, and that's the point that it ends with, you know, salvation. Yeah. So. So let's go on to uh, number seven. Okay. Would you mind reading number seven for me? Quiet your trembling heart by recording and consulting your past experiences of the care and faithfulness of God in former distresses. The experiences we go through are actually food for our faith in our wilderness wanderings. We should consider how far the Lord has brought us in our lives up to this point. We should plead with the Lord as Moses, who did not say as men do, Lord, this is the first fault thou hast not been troubled before to sign their pardon. But Lord, because you have pardoned them so often, I beseech thee, pardon them once again. Numbers 14, 10-14 
Flavel states, So in new difficulties let the saint say, Lord, thou hast often heard, helped and saved in former years. Therefore, now help again, for with thee there is plen plenches, redemption, and thine arm is not shortened. <coughs> so here, you know, we're, we're going back to, you know, reflecting back on the work that the, you know, the Lord does in our lives. You know, where, where He's been there, where he, He's constantly, actually, it's, it's a good reminder of, you know, the, the Lord's work, the consistency of the Lord's work, that the fact of the matter is He's constantly there, you know, as the psalm said, he even has his angels over us. And so, in light of that, what should we do? You know, we should look to the Lord, you know, once again, for our future partners. You know, we should, in other words, that's, we should be keeping our eye. Keep your eye on the ball, you know. <laughs> you know, that's a, another good point. Uh, a lot of times, I think the, 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 the difference between godly men and ungodly men, the ungodly men feels that God owes him to keep him and, to, and to, to help him. The ungodly man sees it as a mercy because he knows he deserves help. He knows he deserves punishment. Yeah. And a lot of times if we keep that mentality, you know, when we see, because we see so many unseen dangers that we go through. We could, you know, been in a wreck and we just pass by like nothing. Like blind the people, but... That, that really helped me is that, uh, what is it that it says right here? That there are experiences we go through are actually food for our faith. And, and if we don't, if we don't take it to, if we don't take it to heart, I think a lot of times that's why a lot of people don't grow because the actual experiences, it's food for our faith because our faith is being actually exercised. Built up. Yeah, mm -hmm. because we're actually going through stuff, but we know that that's, we're having faith in His promises that we don't deserve the mercy that we're getting. We deserve, you know, we deserve hell and we deserve His punishment. Mm -hmm. You know, in contrast to the unbeliever, he's, he feels that God owes him to be happy. You know, why is this happening to me? You know, why am I always going through all this stuff? You know, why, why can't I, things go right for me? And that's the big difference. Like, if God owes him something, when we ourselves, we owe all to our God, you know, instead of, of, of the difference. I thought yeah. that was real good. No, and, that's, and you know, I think, in, in light of what you said, I think uh, if we, what I want to do now is uh, go to Numbers uh, chapter 14, mm -hmm. and we're going to read uh, verses 10 through 14, and I think we're going to we're going to see a good example of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. a contrast between, you know, the way the, the godly and the ungodly deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. Is anybody cold? I should close the door, or is everybody um, okay? I'm okay. Are you okay? Okay. 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 Ok
uh, Joshua and Caleb who came back and said, you know, that they were, you know, for for uh, you know going into the land, while the other ten, you know, looked at it, it, you know, didn't see, you know, the promise of the Lord or or look at it as, you know, in faithing in the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is that is that the, the you know when they decided to do that, you know, the people decided to you know go against them, and so they even went you know against uh, Moses, you know, to it says that they picked they were getting ready to you know stone him right there. <laughs> You know, so talk about getting to the point of sin, yeah. you know. And yet, you know, and what, and what was the Lord going to do? You know, it says that the Lord was going to dispossess them and this and that. But yet, you know, we see a, we see Moses, you know, mediating and pleading for the people, you know. And yeah, and, and appealing to the fact that, you know, that he had, you know, in the past saved them, you know. Amen. So we'll go on to uh, number eight. Would you mind reading that, Albert? Be unsatisfied that you are in the way of your duty in that world, and that will beget holy courage in times of danger. Who will harm you if you be a follower of that which is good, or if any dare attempt to harm you? You may be, you may boldly commit yourself to God and well doing. A good cause should be to bear up a man's spirit. Bible, Bible speaks of a saying of an unbeliever to the, sa- to the shame of uncourageous Christians. When the emperor Vespasian had commanded Pluidus Priceus not to come to the Senate, or if he did come, to speak nothing but what he would have him. The senator returned this noble answer, that he was a senator. It was fit he should be at the center, and if being there, he were required to be give his advice. He would freely speak that which his conscience, with which his conscience commanded him. The emperor threatening that then he should die. He answered, "Did I ever tell you that I was immortal? Do what you will, and I will do what I ought. Uh, it is in your power to put me to death unjustly, and in my power to die with confidence. Righteousness is a breastplate." The breast to let them tremble when danger finds out of the way of duty. So, so here's a good point as far as you know, um, you know how important it is actually to not sin, even if it does mean you know our own death. And you know I like the fact that that uh, you know Flavel uses a a uh, you could say like a secular you know secular story to show you know. Uh, how you know how to be you know consistent character, and you know and make it make it a point to you know Christians who are doubting and you know who are being uncourageous you know to make a point that hey you know even even this unbeliever you know what I mean stood his ground you know for for what was right how much more are we who are you know you know children of God so we'll go on to uh, number nine and uh, Sandra would you mind reading that? Get your conscience sprinkled with the blood of Christ from all guilt, and that will set your heart above all fear. It is a it is a guilt it is guilty a conscience that weakens our heart and makes us cowards. We must stand as the proverb, the righteous are bold as lions. Proverbs 28:1. A guilty conscience can be more terrified by imagined dangers than a pure conscience is by real ones. A guilty sinner walks around in his guilt and is plagued by it, as in the case of guilty Herod who cried out, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, Matthew 14, 1-2. Such a conscience is the devil's anvil, on which he fabricates all those swords and spears with which the guilty sinner pierces himself. Guilt is to danger what fire is to gunpowder. A man need not fear to walk among many barrels of powder if he have not if he have no fire about him. So here's a good example of, you know, having your you know, you could say your your soul, you know, cleansed in the Lord, you know, having being free from guilt, you know, in the blood of Christ because what is, you know, what is guilt too? It ends up, you know, bringing once again burden burden on us and I actually 
I thought it was a clever example, you know, that he used of uh, Herod, because what happened with Herod, you know, he had, uh, you know, unjustly, he had John the Baptist, you know, killed, he had his head, and so, you know, so when Jesus all of a sudden pops up and he's, you know, making miracles, he's already thinking, you know, John the Baptist is back from the dead, <laughs> you know what I mean, so that's a good example, yeah, that's a good example of, you know, of our situation where we can, you know, continually be plagued by our, by our sin, and sometimes, you know, you know, even situations that probably don't even have anything to do with the guilt, we, we, we still, you know, connect it to it because we're, we're dealing with it on a constant basis. Yeah. And so I like how he also points out that, you know, that's a method that the devil can use against us, you know, to, you know, keep us, you know, in our carnal state or from the, rebe- you know, rebelling from the Lord and not keeping him in mind. Yeah. You know? So we'll go on to uh, number 10. And Carlos, would you mind reading that? Exercise holy trust in times of great distress. Make it your business to trust God with your life and comforts, and then your heart will be at rest about Him. Trust in God, as David wrote in Psalms 56, 1 through 4. Go to go to God by acts of faith and trust, and never doubt that He will secure you. Boys, please enjoy the God. Trusting in the Lord. He does not say his ear shall be preserved from the report of evil things. He may hear as sad tidings as other men, but his heart shall be kept from the terror of those tidings. His heart is fixed. Yeah. And we can go to Psalm 56, uh, and we'll read uh, verses 1 through 4 to see an example of this. Actually, would you, would you mind finishing up by reading those four? Sure. You want me to read with? Uh, with oh, it'll be a Psalm 56, uh, verses right. 1 through 4. 1 through 4. Be, be merciful unto me, O God, for man shall swallow me up. He fighting daily oppress me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me. O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee, and God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. So in other words, what? You know, even in the time of distress, what do we do? We trust in the Lord. And we got to put into practice, you know, our faith and trust in Him. We'll go on to uh, number 11. Uh, would you mind reading that, Angela, actually? Do you have, do you have the... Yes. No. Would that be okay? Or? Yeah. I know no. you just came in, so... <laughs> Number 11? Yes, please. Okay. Um, consult the um, honor of religion more in your personal safety life. A good question is, how is it for the honor of religion that Christians would be as afraid as hares who startle us at every sound? Will not this tempt the world to think that in whatever you you talk, your principles are no better than other men's? Um, what mischief may they discover of your fears before them? Let us realize what was nobly, what was nobly said by Nehemiah. Uh, should such a man as I see, and who being as and who being as I am, would flee? Sorry, I'm getting a little um, Where is it not better you should die than the world should be prejudiced against Christ by your example? Let not your fears lay such a stumbling block before the blind world. Mm-hmm. So, right. so I think this, so point, point number number eleven seems to be you know a little bit more consumed with you know having having a good testimony, you know worrying more about you know our faith, you could say, you know than than uh, you know yeah than our personal safety, mm-hmm. and you know so we we see uh, Nehemiah is used here as an example. And now let me read that really quick so we get a little bit of the context. So it's going to be Nehemiah 6, verses 10 through 13. It's 
going to be uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. <coughs> Six, yeah, verses, uh, yeah, ten through thirteen. Let me know when you guys are ready. <coughs> ready? All right. So we got when I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home, he said. Let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, should a, should a man like me flee? Could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because... Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act according, accordingly and sin, so that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Remember, O oh my God, Tobiah and Sanballat according to these works of theirs, and also Nodiah the prophetess and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten me. So, you know, so you have a good example there that, you know, um, if he would have given in, you know, he would have given in to the plan of his enemies. So it's very important. It's very important because, you know, if we're consistent, you know, that's actually in keeping our heart and standing our ground, you know, we're being, you know, we're giving a good testimony to the Lord. That's one of the, you know, very important uh, reason to consider, you know, the keeping of the heart. We'll go ahead and uh, go now to uh, point no, uh, direct. Direction number 12. And would you mind reading that, Caleb? Sure. He that would secure his heart from fear must first secure the eternal interest of his soul in the hands of Jesus Christ. To secure your heart, it is... Uh, to secure your heart is to not fear even mortal danger. As Christ said, fear not them that can kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Luke 12, 4. The assured Christian may smile with contempt upon all his enemies and say, Is this the worst that you can do? What say you, Christian? Are you assured that your soul is safe? That within a few moments of your disillusion, uh... It shall be received by uh, Christ into an everlasting habitation. If you be sure of that, never trouble yourself about the instrument and means of your death. So, yeah. I mean, if we're in the hands of Christ, then basically, what do we have to fear? So, let, so yeah, let's go on. So, let's go on to. Uh, Point uh, 13, and would you mind reading it, sir? Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I'll have you do it anyway. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and learn to quench all slavish creatures, creature fear, in the reverential, re reverential? reverential fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10. And a necessary exercise of Christian wisdom is to turn those passions of the soul which most predominate into spiritual channels. To turn nature, natural anger into spiritual zeal, natural mirth into holy cheerfulness, and natural fear into a holy dread and awe of God. And in Isaiah, in Isaiah 12, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll go ahead and read that. Let's, wow. let's go ahead and look at Isaiah 8 uh, verses 12 through 15. Chapter 8, verses 12 through 15. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to have Cindy read that, read that portion for us. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people, no, that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear. And then his... Is that the right verse? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. We're in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah? Oh, Isaiah yeah. 8? Okay, oh, no problem, no problem. <laughs> I was lost there for a second. No problem. Um, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. To both the houses of Israel and as, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait on the Lord, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Yeah, I think that's it. It was just up to 15. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Good zeal. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so pretty much, you know, the... I was just about to get to the good part. I <laughs> know. <laughs> that, that's for, for next session. Next next yeah, next session. Again. <laughs> yeah, but pretty much, uh, you know, like I... Like at Proverbs 9, 10 says, you know, the the beginning of wisdom, you know, begins with fear of the Lord. <coughs> we see here, you know, that, you know, the Lord, you know, He's he'll, He's going to definitely take His vengeance. So, you know, that's one thing. Another thing that we want to consider in terms of, you know, we're busy being consumed with, like I said, you know, the problems that we have here. But we don't keep in mind, you know, that the day of vengeance is coming, you know, for the Lord. And it's going to be a dreadful day, especially because we know that, you know, the Word of God is faithful, you know. And our last point will be a 14, and I'll let you have the privilege of giving the last point. <coughs> pour out to God in prayer those fears which the devil and your own unbelief pour in upon you in times of danger. Prayer is the best outlet and solution to fear. The greatest example to encourage our hearts to compliance is Jesus Christ. When the hour of his danger and death drew nigh, he went into the garden, separated from his disciples, and there wrestled mighty with God in prayer, even unto agony. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. Tell us how he was heard to strengthen and support to him through it, though not as to deliverance or exemption from it. Oh, that these things may abide with you and be reduced to practice in these evil days, and that many trembling may be established by them. Yeah. So yeah. So the final, so the final point is, you know, to for us to to pray, to pray because that's the outlet that we have, and you know, that's the solution that we have, which is, you know, to seek the Lord, seek His face, and, you know, and to call upon Him. And we have the greatest example of all, which is, you know, Jesus Christ. You know, what did He do? And it's, you know, even in, even in His time, you know, when He was pleading with the Lord regarding His own life, when He was gonna, you know, you know, have to give up His his, his life, you know, for the death on the cross, you know, what did he do? He turned, to, he turned to the Lord, even though, you know, he was, like it says here, he was not going to be exempt from it. So that's our lesson to us too, which is that in terms of keeping our heart, you know, we got to be consistent. we got to let, allow, you know, not allow fear, you know, especially in, in these temporal times, you know, to come upon us and, you know, cause us to sin because we also know that our testimony is important. And so what we want to do is, I like what it says at the end, which it says, Oh, that these things may abide with you and be reduced to practice in these evil days, that many trembling may be established by them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we need to be, you know, fearing the Lord and, you know, not being mindful of the world that we're living, but the world that we w- will be living in, you know, and being mindful of that. Mm-hmm. So with that, I thank you. And that's the end of our study. <laughs> <laughs>